So I uh, just want to introduce Michael here, Michael McCarty, uh, world traveler and world storyteller. And uh, let him kind of speak for himself here. He does it so well. But uh, he is a professional storyteller, tells uh, stories almost just about every day of the year, uh, whether he's paid or not. <laughs> and uh, he's from Chicago originally, lives in LA now, came down for uh, our performance today. Uh, as I say, he's traveled all over the world. What we'll do for the uh, format here is uh, Michael tell stories, and then we'll leave some time at the end uh, for questions and answers. Uh, so y if you have questions, just save them for the end. And uh, we'll finish. I know you have to be out of here 1045 for other classes and so on. So uh, we'll, we'll aim to finish by, by that time. So if you'd welcome Michael McCarty. All right, thank you. All right, how y'all doing this morning? OK, not enough coffee in the house, OK. <laughs> Yep, or I understand. Um, the first thing I'm going to do, because this always ends up as a question, and I know it still will, but people say, you do what? You tell stories for a living? Yes, I do. My motto is, and my website is, have mouth, we'll run it. <laughs> so let me start right away by just telling you how I became a professional storyteller. Now. I've been telling stories a long time, according to my mother, as long as I could talk. But I started telling stories formally when I was in high school in the 60s in Chicago. And I discovered this thing that is black history. And I read, I'm a voracious reader, I read, found out all kinds of things, and started telling stories about the things that I had read, to the point where, at the high school I was going to, they had me tell stories not only at that high school, but sent me out to, and some other people out to other high schools in the area to share these stories. And then a um, whole lot of life happened. Uh, my original plan in life was to have been a physicist. I became a revolutionary instead. A little bit of a diversion. And um, I was in the Black Panther Party for a time in the 60s and early 70s. Uh, left, had a daughter, got married, a whole bunch of more life, became an acupuncturist, uh, and done a lot of traveling. I've been to over 25, oh, oh, 25 countries, I think, not counting the US. And um, I got stuck in Los Angeles in 1986. I had been traveling to uh, India and Taiwan. And when I got back, I'd gone from Chicago through LA. When I got back to LA, I had $18, no return ticket to Chicago. Come to find out that my car, who I left with a friend, who was supposed to pay the car note, who didn't, my sister had co-signed for me on that car. I was in no hurry to go back to Chicago. And so I'm out in LA, and um, I had my first Los Angeles winter. Now coming from Chicago, I'm like, you call this winter? You can't get rid of me now, all right? So I'm trying to get my acupuncture license out there in LA. But every time I try to get my license, a Himalayan mountain range falls into my path. So in 1992, I happened to be at CAGE, the Conference on Alternatives in Jewish Education. That's another story. And I met this guy named Joel Ben Izzy from Berkeley. And he was introduced, me, introduced to me as a professional storyteller. I said, you do what? People pay you to tell stories? How the hell you do that? So I started picking his brain. And he was very open, very sharing. Gave me one of his tapes, encouraged me. And as we're talking, I said, I'm going to do this. And my motto was going to be, have mouth, we'll run it. It just oh, 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 came to me in a flash of inspiration. About a week later, I asked myself, what would I do as a profession if I was independently wealthy? I said, I tell stories. I said, OK, that's what I'm going to do. So I went to my local library. I was living in the Echo Park area of LA at the time. And I'm getting books about storytelling and collections of folk tales. Every few days, like I said, I'm a voracious reader. So every few days, I'm in and out of this library with an armload of books. One day, this librarian who's helping me find a particular book says, why are you getting all these books? Are you writing a paper? I said, no, I'm a storyteller. He says, you're a storyteller? I've got these teenagers. They want to learn storytelling. Can you give them a workshop? I said, sure. My mama told me if I could read, I could do anything. I read my butt off. I gave the workshop. It was a great success. 
I became a resource for the LA library system. Then I've got my business cards, and I'm handing my business cards out to all my friends. Hi, I'm a storyteller. Now give me some money, I'll tell you a story. And there's a bookstore, a very well-known bookstore in LA called the Bodhi Tree Bookstore. And um, I used to spend a lot of time there, so I gave my card to a bunch of my friends there. Four of these friends were specifically helpful in helping me get my storytelling career going. One friend said, I've got um, a friend who works at the Cultural Affairs Department, and they hire storytellers. I'm going to pass her your card. I became a resource for them. For them. Another friend said, you know, Mike, I saw uh, we have a magazine. It's called a storytelling magazine. There's some kind of national storytelling magazine. I got that magazine. I joined that organization. I'm now on the board of directors of that organization. Another friend said, you know, there's, there's, there's some storytelling groups right here in LA. I've got a friend who goes to them. I became a member of virtually all of those groups in the LA area, and now I started also my own group, which is, we've just been going on for 11 years. And another friend said, there's a storytelling concert coming up. It was a benefit concert for a bookstore that had gotten burned down in the LA riots in uh, 1992. And so I went to this concert. There were 12 African and African American storytellers telling tales from all over. And I was like, I can do this. And I became friends with a bunch of those people. And five of those people and myself formed a collective called Tellers and Talkers. There are four of us left in it now. And we still perform in the LA area. And so things were just kicking. I had found my new career. Now, let me step back a little bit. This, this, this all kicked off in 1992. How many of you know what you want to be when you grow up? How many of you do not have a clue? All right, my peoples. In 1991, I was at this vegetarian restaurant in Hollywood owned by a friend of mine named Orion. And this friend of mine and I were in the restaurant, and she asked Orion how he got into the restaurant business. Because he had gone to school to be an architect. And running a restaurant is far from being an architect. He read something, I think there's this book called um, What Color Is Your Parachute? I think he read it in there. You should make a list of 10 things that you like to do. Not things that you want to do for money, although you can do that if you want to, but just 10 things that you like to do on a day-to-day -day basis, and then look to make a living doing some combination of those 10 things. I said, that's a great idea, Orion. Give me a piece of paper. I sat down, made a list of 10 things. Love to read, love to write, love to make people laugh, love to eat popcorn, love to cook, da 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 That was 91. 92, I became a professional storyteller. 93, 94. I'm going through my files, and I came across that list. Of the 10 things that were on that list, at least half of them I do as a storyteller, and a couple of more things I do as supplements to what I do. So now I'm a professional storyteller. I tell folk tales, historical stories, personal stories, stories of my travels and experiences, and stories of the brilliant and absolutely stupid stuff I've done in my life. <laughs> I've got a lot of material. So, the first story, I, I, I'm going to tell you a little bit, of, I'm going to tell you some folk tales, some historical stories, and at least one personal story. And I'm going to kick off with a personal story, um, especially since we're at a college campus. And I'm going to tell you the story about my daughter. And it's a story that I call, That's My Baby. Now, when my daughter was born, it was very, very clear there were certain things she had inherited from moi. Besides good looks, the girl was loud. You know how some babies cry? <coughs> Not my daughter Carla. <coughs> and she could cry for hours on end. Now, my daughter was born in 1970, before the VCR. So when you had a child, your life as you knew it was over, what well, it still is. But back in those days, especially when it came to movies, movies were things that other people without kids did. If you could forget about seeing a movie. Well, one day, my oldest and one of my best friends heard, he said, Mike, 
why don't you all go to a movie and, uh, and, and have dinner? I'll watch Carla for you. We were gone. Because when you get an offer like that, you do not give them a chance to change their mind. Now, you know, or maybe you don't know, but babies have this sixth sense. They know when you try to sneak out and have some fun. And as soon as she sensed we were getting ready to go have some fun, she started wailing. We ran out the door. <laughs> we went to a movie. And then we had dinner at a real restaurant with plates, real plates and metal silverware. Oh, it was glorious. It was like going to the Bahamas, OK? Four or five hours were gone. We came back home, opened the door. Ah! Carla had never stopped crying. Four or five hours. My buddy Herb was. <laughs> to this day, my buddy Herb is as bald as a cue ball. And I think it's from ripping his hair out that particular day. Well, when my daughter was coming up, she was such a sweet, obedient child. She would rush home from school to do her homework and then help her friends with their homework. And she always wanted to do exactly as she was told. Let me give you an example. So I drop her off at her elementary school in Chicago. Because of the way that I came in, I was always on the opposite side of the street from the school, and it was a major street. So I would walk her across the street, and as she got older, I would make sure there was no traffic coming and let her go across the street on her own. Well, one morning, I checked, there's no traffic. I said, okay, Carla, you can go across the street. But Daddy, they told us we have to cross the street down there <laughs> at the other end of the block where there's a crossing guard. I said, yes, baby, they want somebody to look out for you. That's what I'm doing, so it's okay for you to cross the street here. But Daddy, <laughs> they told us we have to cross the street down there. I said, baby. They don't want you to get hit by a car. Neither do I. <laughs> so it's OK for you to cross the street here. But daddy, get your little butt across that street. <laughs> She's going across the street. <laughs> <laughs> I watched her walk into the school. Usually, this is when I would pull off. But something made me wait. My father's sense was tingling. I just went across the next intersection and pulled in front of another car. Here comes my daughter, back out to school, walking down the street so she can go across the street and then come back across like she was supposed to. <laughs> she was such a sweet and obedient child. And then she became a, ah! which is basically how parents feel about the teenage years. One day you have this child who looks at you lovingly, I love you so much. And the next day, they're looking at you like, whatever. <laughs> Talk to the hand. Am I really related to you? I'm so smart. Where did it come from? <laughs> now, one of the greatest challenges for fathers of daughters during the teenage years is Dating. boyfriends. <sighs> In fact, there's this unwritten rule of fatherhood. You cannot smile. When you first meet a boyfriend, unless you have a weapon. <laughs> I found this out from a girlfriend's father in a very direct sense, and that's another story. So now, my daughter's about 13, 14 years old. My sister tells me, Carla's out on the front porch with her boyfriend. I'm going to bring him in and meet you. And I said, OK, because <laughs> you got to have your father voice. And you got to have a crazed look in your eye. And if you can make your eyeballs go in different directions, that's all good. And if not, or to supplement that, at a strategic point in a conversation with the young boy, you let a big glob of drool drop out the corner of your mouth. <laughs> so my daughter brings a little boy in, and he's obviously all nervous. Uh, hi, Mr. McCarty. And I take his little hand, <laughs> snapping, <laughs> crunching bone. And he's looking all scared. I said, boy, you ain't got to be scared. They made me put my gun's away. <laughs> I let that glob of drool drop. <laughs> Little boy like the passed out. Now, interestingly enough, like I said, my daughter was about 13 or 14 years old. I didn't meet another one of my daughter's boyfriends until last year. 
okay? Word had got out, all right? So now my daughter is in high school. She's in her junior year in high school. And my daughter used to always get very good grades. But somewhere in the midst of her junior year, she got that attitude. And she started bringing home these mediocre grades. Now her mother is this brilliant woman who has never known anything but an A from kindergarten to her doctorate. She kept telling her, you got to do better, you got to do better. One day, Carla comes home with, I don't know, a C, a D, or maybe an F. But her mother didn't get mad. She said, well, it seems that you don't want to study. That's OK. That's just fine. She went with her the next day to school and withdrew her from school. She said, you go get a job, full-time job, 40 hours a week, and all the overtime I can stand you doing. Free ride was over. She calls me up, Daddy, Daddy, I'm not going to be able to graduate and go to college. I said, look, Carla, you're old enough to take the GED, get your equivalency diploma. Then you can go to a junior college or a small college, take some classes, until you figure out what you want to do. She said, OK. She recovered quickly. So she goes to Columbia College in Chicago. She takes a writing class because she loves to write. One of the first assignments they had, they had to write about a moment of transformation in their lives. And this is what she wrote about. When she was about 10 years old, her and her little buddies who were her age, they liked to hang out with these older girls. Now you know what that meant at that age. Older meant a year or a year and a half older which at that age is like Yoda, OK? <laughs> so now these older girls, they like to talk about things and do things that Carla and her little friends had absolutely no interest in. They like to talk about boys. Carla and her little friends, they didn't care about no boys, but the older girls did it, so it was OK. These older girls like to sneak off and try to smoke cigarettes and use cuss words. And Carla and her little friends, they knew they shouldn't do that, but the older girls did it, so it was OK. One day. One of these older girls announced that she was having a birthday party. And she was giving invitations uh, to all the kids in the neighborhood, everybody except my daughter, Carla. At first, Carla thought it was an oversight. But it became very, very clear that it was not. But she kept trying to get invited to the party, all the way up until the day of the party. But she was literally turned away at the door. As she sat in the window, because the party was right across the street, as she sat in that window, watching all of her friends go into that party, she vowed, tears streaming down her face, she vowed then and there that never again in her life would she compromise her principles or beliefs to be with any individual or any group of people. She was about 10 years old. I know folks 30, 40, 90 years old haven't figured that out yet. So she keeps on going, and at some point, she decides she wants to become a teacher. And in 1995, she graduated from the University of Illinois in Chicago with a degree in education. Just before the graduation ceremony was about to commence, I pulled my daughter to the side. I said, Carla, it is my right and duty as your father to embarrass you at this wonderful moment in your life. <laughs> I said, when you go across that stage to get your diploma, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to yell at the top of my lungs, that's my baby! <laughs> Not only did I do it, I didn't just stand at my seat. I walked up to the front of the auditorium. I stood in front of those hundreds of people. And when my daughter crossed that stage, I pointed at her, yelled it much louder than I did just now. I don't want to break the man's uh, little sound system here. <laughs> now, my daughter knows me. She knows I am going to do this. She knows there is no escape. She says, OK, Daddy, but Daddy, Daddy, please, Daddy, don't do your yell. <laughs> and that's the end of that. <laughs> A little addendum to that story. Two years ago, my daughter got her master's in fine art and fiction writing, and, uh, fiction writing. Not only did I do my yell, but I got this really great horn that was so loud. 
I can't wait till she gets a doctorate. <laughs> so I tell all kinds of stories. And one of the things that I look for in especially the folk tales and the historical uh, stories that I do is I look for the uncommon story. Um, how many of you have heard of Harriet Tubman? Just about everybody, right? I don't do stories about Harriet Tubman. I do a story I'm going to do for you now about a couple named William and Ellen Craft um, that took place during the slavery period. And at, at the end of the story, don't let me go on to the next piece without telling you why I changed the title of the story. The story I call now Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom. William and Ellen Craft were house slaves. As house slaves, they didn't have to go out into the fields and do the hard physical labor. William was a carpenter, and he made cabinets and did all kinds of carpentry work, not only for his master, but his master hired him out to other slave owners in the Macon, Georgia area. And he even allowed William to do some work on his own and earn his own money. Now, Ellen was a seamstress. She made dresses and curtains and dollies for her master and his wife. Now, they were owned by two different slave owners. But they had their own house together, which was very unusual, very, very uncommon. They were close to married as generally slaves could get, especially having that kind of living situation. But they had no children, and that was with intent. You see, William had seen his mother and father, two sisters and two brothers, all sold off to different slave owners in, uh, all around the South. Ellen's situation was a little different. Ellen's father was her mother's master. And because of this, Ellen looked like she was white. Now, the master had a wife. Ellen worked in that house, and every day that wife saw Ellen knowing what was going on. Needless to say, she was not pleased. And then one day something happened that would seal Ellen's fate to a degree. One of the wife's friends came by the house, first time by the house, first time seeing Ellen, looked at Ellen and said, what a lovely daughter you got. Oh, it was on then. Oh, she had to go. But her husband wouldn't let her just sell Ellen off to anybody. But when their daughter got married, Ellen was given as a wedding present. So now, here they are living in what might be considered the Beverly Hills of slavery. But whether your cage is made of tin or your cage is made of gold, it's still a cage. And in 1848, they decided they had had enough. They wanted to escape. They wanted to use the fact that Ellen looked like she was white. But a white woman would not be traveling with a black male slave. And they had to make it from Macon, Georgia, all the way to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the first free port. So they decided to disguise Ellen as a man. Over months, they started procuring the things they would need for the uh, disguise. Various clothing, whatever William couldn't buy with the money he'd earned, Ellen would make. But they had several things that they had to overcome. Neither of them knew how to read or write. And in traveling from Macon, Georgia to Philadelphia, they would be traveling by stagecoach, by uh, train, by boat, they would stay overnight in the hotels, and the master would be expected to sign in. So what they did is they would put Ellen's arm in a sling like the arm was broken. And then in that situation, you would just ask the proprietor to sign for you. Well, next they had to decide, uh, disguise the fact that she had no facial hair. Now, in those days, if you had a toothache, they rubbed some foul smell and stuff on your face, and they rubbed gauze all around your face. And that's what they did to disguise the lack of facial hair. The last element of the disguise was something to disguise Ellen's eyes. Not only because they were very feminine, but also Ellen didn't want people to be able to look in her eyes and see how scared she was. 
because if they were caught, their days as house slaves would be over. At the very, very least, they would be put to work in the fields after being beaten. Maybe worse, they might be killed. So they got her some green tinted sunglasses to complete the disguise. December 21st, 1848, Mr. Johnson and his slave William arrived at the train station. Mr. Johnson bought two tickets, one for himself in the first class compartment, another for William in a slave car at the very end of the train. Mr. Johnson sat down by the window, and I'm sure Ellen was trying to gather herself, and she was looking out the window, and who does she see running towards the train but William's master? He had gotten suspicious. They had gotten a pass for the weekend to go visit relatives, but he had gotten suspicious, and he was running towards the train. He didn't even look in the first class. He was trying to get back there to the slave car, but the train pulled off before he could get back there and find William there. Now, I'm sure that Ellen must have breathed a sigh of relief. It was a short sigh. The world can be a very small place. Sometimes that's good, sometimes it ain't. Who should come and sit down right next to Mr. Johnson but Ellen's master's best friend, who's known Ellen all of her life? who had just been by the house the previous evening for dinner. She had just served this man dinner the night before. Mr. Johnson looked out the window and thought, what am I going to do? Being a good Southern gentleman, this man going to start talking. So Ellen decided to pretend that she was hard of hearing. So when he started talking, she kept looking out the window. Now, what do we do when someone doesn't seem to hear us? We talk. And he started talking real loud. And then somebody else said, oh, it must really be hard going through life, hard of hearing. The man caught himself and says, I will not bother this man again. Now, these were just two of many close calls that they would have on this journey. Now, Mr. Johnson would be sitting with the other slave owners during meal time. And they would say to Mr. Johnson in the course of discussion, why are you going to Philadelphia? And when Mr. Johnson explained that he was going to Philadelphia for his health, they said, what? You're going to Philadelphia in December for your health? That's not where you need to go. You need to go to, to uh, New Orleans or to Florida. But Mr. Johnson said, for my peculiar condition, the North is where I need to go. And they didn't know what was up, OK? Now, as they got closer to Philadelphia, abolitionists were on the train, and they would talk to William. They would tell William, you're going to, to a, 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 a free state. When you get there, when you get to Philadelphia, you, you run away from your master. It'll be all right. William explained, I'll never run away from my master. And they didn't know what was up either. But they gave William information on a hotel that was run by abolitionists in Philadelphia. They arrived in Philadelphia Christmas Day, 1848. How's that for a Christmas present? Freedom. They went to that abolitionist hotel. Mr. Johnson checked in, went upstairs to change. William was bringing in the luggage. The owner of the hotel came to William and said, I need to talk to your so-called master. This is a free state. We're abolitionists here. We don't cotton to this slavery. Where's your master? Just then Ellen, who had changed, was coming down the stairs. And William said, there she is. And he looked at Ellen and said, oh, I'm talking about, no, that's the, I'm talking about, where'd she come from? I'm talking about the man who brought you here. And he said, there he is. And they sat him down and they told their story. This was an amazing story. He invited other abolitionists to hear this story. They'd never heard anything like this. They wouldn't hear a more amazing story till about two years later, when Henry Box Brown, y'all heard of Henry Box Brown? Henry Box Brown was a slave in the South. He had some white friends put him in a box and mail him to freedom. <laughs> so all these abolitionists came to hear this amazing story. 
And then William and Ellen were invited to speak at the abolitionist meetings. Well, they were glad to do so. Everybody came, hundreds and hundreds of people, to hear this amazing story, including the press. Mm -hmm. That story was written up in many papers, and those papers found their way back to Macon, Georgia. William and Ellen's masters knew where they were. They hired a slave catcher. By this time, they had settled in Boston. William had a little carpentry shop. He's working in the shop one day. A man comes by the shop who William knows to be a friend of his masters. It's the slave catcher. He acts all surprised. William, I'm surprised to see you here. Listen, William, I'm going back to Macon tomorrow. Why don't you and your wife come by my hotel tonight? Um, I'm going back to Macon, and I, 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 uh, she'll want to send a message to her, to her mama, and, and William, I know where your, 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 your mama is and one of your sisters. You can send them a message. Come on by, please. William and Ellen were just learning how to read and write, but they weren't stupid. They told the abolitionists who this man was. They ran him out of town. But they decided that was too close a call. So they headed to Canada. And from Canada, they boarded a ship and they went to England. And in England, they had five children, four sons and a daughter raised in freedom. From England, through his abolitionist friends, William was able to find his mother and one of his sisters and buy their freedom. Then after the Civil War, William and four of the children, the other one said, Y'all done told me too much about the place. I ain't going there. They moved back to Georgia. Georgia. They bought several hundred acres of land, and they established a school so that newly free slaves could learn skills so they could enjoy their freedom. And that's the story of William and Ellen Craft running 1,000 miles for freedom. And that's the end of that. Hmm. Now, originally I called the story Two Tickets to Freedom because that was the name of the first book where I'd heard the story. And then a few years later, I was hired by the California Health, uh, Health Control Department to do a presentation at a conference in Sacramento. Um, flew up the morning of the conference with Teresa, the woman who'd hired me, and her coworker and friend Peggy. Peggy and I were sitting at a table together waiting for the conference to begin. And at some point, Peggy got up, walked away, came back about 10 or 15 minutes later with a book. She set the book in front of me on the table. It was Running a Thousand Miles for Freedom by William Kraft. Now, when I had first started researching this story, I had seen this book in bibliographies, but it was out of print. And so when I saw it in front of me, it was like putting a piece of gold in front of me. And then I said, wait a minute. I don't think Peggy's ever heard me tell this story. I said, Peggy, how did you know that I tell this story? She says, I didn't. You tell this story? No. These are my great, great grandparents. I had an opportunity to tell my version of the story to the descendants of the crafts. Peggy's mother, who had done a docudrama on the crafts in the 60s, now, she was a very old woman at the time, and she was dealing with Alzheimer's. When I started telling that story, her mind got right. She made some corrections, okay? But like I said, sometimes the world is a small place, and sometimes it's a good thing. Now, so those are the kind of stories that I like to find um, when I research doing historical pieces. Now, I do all kinds of folk tales. I, like I, I think I mentioned I've been to about 25 different countries. Uh, I spent a lot of time in, um, I've been to India six times, uh, all over, a lot, a lot of Asia, uh, four countries in Africa, and what have you. I, I love to travel. I love to travel. I love to travel. How many of you have done some traveling? All right. When you get a chance, go. And keep it going. So, um, this, the, but the next story that I want to tell you, I want to tell you this, this African-American folk tale. I'll tell you a, a, another uh, in, uh, 
story from someplace else in a minute, but I want to tell you this African-American folk tale, because I like it. And I'm doing a program where I can tell anything I want. Ah! So this is, a, how many of you have ever heard of a character named High John the Conqueror? Oh, good. It's up to me to educate you. OK. Now, High John's stories were stories that were told during slavery times. But unlike the Br'er Rabbit type stories that had come from Africa, the High John stories were stories that were told amongst the slaves. And when you hear this one particular story, you'll understand why. High John, as I said, was this mythical slave character. And they used to say of High John, he wouldn't pick cotton. He wouldn't bale hay. He wouldn't take a beating, but he wouldn't run away, because he was a trickster. And he was usually tricking old massa. Well, it was the day before Christmas. And every year at Christmas, John had a task. And that task was to prepare the Christmas turkey for old Massa and his family. Now, old Massa had had enough of John always tricking him. He decided he was going to play a trick on John. So he called him to him the day before Christmas and said, John, yes, sir, Massa, you going to prepare that Christmas turkey? Yes, sir, Massa, I'm prepared. I always do. You know, I now, you can be sure that when John prepared that turkey, some of that turkey would find its way into John's belly. Wing be missing. Leg gone. All right? He said, yeah, I'm going to prepare the Christmas turkey. He said, John, we're doing something different this year. Whatever you do to that turkey, we're going to do to you. Uh-oh. <laughs> he thought if he plucked that turkey's feathers, they'd skin him alive. And if he chopped off that turkey's head, <clears throat> ultimate haircut. But John was quick of wit, and he came up with a plan. Christmas Day. Old Mass and the family, they all sit down on the porch. They all in on this joke on John. Here comes John down the road with that turkey, feather and head intact. Master says, John, yes, sir, Master, you remember what I told you? Yes, sir, Master, I know what you said. Whatever I do to this turkey, y'all, all y'all going to do to me? That's right, John. What you going to do? Well, Master, I'm going to show you. John picked that turkey up, set that turkey up on the porch. Grabbed that turkey by the tail feathers, raised those tail feathers up, and <laughs> kissed it smack dab in the butt. <laughs> then he turned to old Mass and his family, flipped up his coattails. He got dressed up for this. Y'all take your time now. I ain't going nowhere. And that's the end of that. <laughs> I like that story. <laughs> um, so I've done a folk tale, I've done a historical story, I've done a personal story. Now I'm just going to dance around and do whatever comes. Um, sometimes, this is just, just a little addendum, you never know what you might ultimately end up doing in your life. Like I said, I wanted to be a physicist from the time I was in fifth grade up until my senior year in high school. And like I said, I became a revolutionary. Then I went to I was a math major. I was an electrical engineer uh, at DeVry. And um, um, like I said, became an eventually became an acupuncturist. And all these various things sent me here, there, and a little bit everywhere. But every now and then, you have signs sometime that sort of give you a little boop, boop on what you might be doing, though you might not understand it at the time. As I said, I've made many trips to India. And on one of my trips to India, I have a spiritual teacher there, and I was at this ashram, and I had a roommate, a guy from New York named Roy. So we're sitting around in a room just sort of talking about whatever one day, and he says to me, Mike, do you mind if I share something with you? Uh, I'm somewhat psychic, and I have this image that keeps popping in my mind when I'm talking to you. I said, yeah, okay. And he says, I see you talking to Hundreds, no, thousands and thousands of people, all kinds of people, people from all over the world. He goes on and on to expound on this. I'm like, OK. Sounds very interesting, but so what? All right. So that was uh, 1986. 1992, I became a professional storyteller. 1994, I'm giving a presentation to about 1,000 people at a conference in the Poconos. And as I walk out 
to speak to these thousand people who's sitting in the front row, Roy. I look, I said, yeah, 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 it's happening. <laughs> and then I had another thing happen on another trip, a, a later trip to India. Um, I was at this place called, this town called Cody Canal, and there was a, you know, you go see the spiritual teacher in the morning, you go see him in the afternoon, and after the morning session, go have breakfast, hang out with my group and stuff like that. And then around noon or so after having lunch, I go back in my room until it was time to go for the afternoon session. So one day, now I'd be sitting in my room reading, writing, meta sleeping, you know, whatever. And this particular day, I'm sitting on my bed. All of a sudden, I find myself getting up, gathering my things, and leaving. I have no idea where I'm going, and I have no control over what I'm doing. I'm, I'm like a puppet, you know. I'm walking. I'm like, I lock my door. I gather my stuff. I'm walking along. I'm thinking, well, where the hell am I going? And I keep walking. Maybe I'm going to this place. I walk past there. Maybe I'm going over here. I walk past there. And I find myself walking to this restaurant. I say, why am I going to this restaurant? One, I am not hungry. And two, they're not serving now. It's like my body says, shut up and open the door. I open the door. There are three people sitting at a table. This guy named Gary I know, who's also there for the spiritual teacher, this Israeli woman, and he's Jap this Japanese man. They all look at me, and then my friend says, Gary says, here he is. They were asking him questions about the spiritual teacher, teacher and I had a reputation as a storyteller telling stories about my own experiences and others' experiences. He had just said, Michael should be here to tell you stories <laughs> when I walked into the door. Who knew? Well, with that, let me tell you a, um, a story from India. This is a personal story also. It's a story that I call the power of love. Now, I love to travel, and in 1988, 89, I was going around the south of India, going to temples and ashrams and doing my own spiritual thing, getting my spiritual groove on, okay? So some friends of mine showed up at a town called Pondicherry. We went to go visit this place called the Sri Aurobindo Ashram. Now, we arrived in the bus station. My two friends went directly to the main ashram hotel, the park guest house. I told them there, I'd meet them there a little later. I wasn't concerned about getting a room. It was the hot season in the south of India, 120 degrees in the shade. The guidebook said, India, a travel survival guide, if you're going to India at this time of year in the south of India, you ain't got to worry about making no reservation. Nobody in the right mind is there except me and my friends. So. After about an hour or so of roaming around the town, I go to the hotel. As I'm walking up the steps to the hotel lobby, I notice that this elderly Indian woman gave me a real dirty look. And then she said something to the man who was sitting behind the desk. I walk up to this gentleman. He says, can I help you? I said, yes, I'd like a room. We don't have any rooms. Keys all over the board, up, down, and sideways. I mean, just keys falling on the floor. I said, well, did so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so check in, asking about my two friends who just happened to be white? He looks and says, well, yes, they did. Now, I'm picking up on something, duh. But I don't want to believe what I'm picking up on because I'm at an ashram, a um, spiritual place. But I maintain my spiritual equanimity. I said, um, when will some rooms become available? Maybe in a couple of days. I go check into another hotel. The next morning, I'm having breakfast with my friends in this hotel restaurant, only place in town with whole wheat toast. I'm a whole wheat toast kind of guy. We're having breakfast, and I see a guy that I know who had checked into the hotel after I'd been by there the previous evening, because I had seen him at dinner, and he said he was going to go check into the hotel, and I said, well, they don't have any rooms. He's looked at me like I had lost my mind. And I maintain a positive attitude. Some rooms must have suddenly become available. I go to the lobby. 
There that woman is, the one who'd given me the dirty look. There she is, checking some people in. Now I'm standing off to the side, waiting for her to take care of business. She looks at me and says, what do you want? With attitude. I said, well, I came to see if you had some rooms available. No, we don't have any rooms, and this isn't just some hotel. This is for people who are coming for the street or Abindo Ashram. Like, I'm halfway around the world, and I don't know this. <laughs> I am P.O.'d. I've had enough of this town. I have enough of this ashram. I make arrangements to leave the following evening. The next morning, I come back to have breakfast with my friends in this hotel restaurant. As I'm getting ready to walk into the restaurant, I am physically barred from entering and told that I have to go get this person's permission to go in. Now, time out. You're talking about your former 60s militant type, OK? I know how to yell, scream, cuss, and fuss. Ain't done it in a, how, in a while, but I still remember how. But I maintain my spiritual equanimity. I go to the lobby, madam. She's sitting there behind the desk. Madam, is there some problem? I'm just having breakfast with my friends. I was just in here yesterday. May I go in? No, you wait in the lobby. Oh, it's on now. Oh, she done messed with the wrong person. Now, I'm getting ready to raise some cane up in here. But in the midst of my getting ready to raise all this ruckus, this voice in my head says, this is a test. It's easy to love those that love you. The test is to love those that hate you. And I figure this woman qualifies. <laughs> now, you must understand, love was not uppermost in my mind <laughs> and things that I wanted to send her. There's a rather hot, fiery place I've heard of I would love to have sent her there. Joyfully use my size 13s to help her get there. I'm thinking love. I was thinking the Fred Sanford kind of love. And then I remembered something that I had, I had read about auras, the energy that surrounds every living thing. And I remember reading that pink was the color that represented divine love. And I thought, we definitely needed some divine love up in him. <laughs> so mentally, I enveloped her in this bubble of pink light, and I started pumping pink at her butt. <laughs> I mean, I was pumping pink. I was pumping pink. I pumped pink. I worked up a sweat pumping pink. I mean, I'm I sat there for about five or 10 minutes pumping pink. Suddenly, the woman comes over to me, totally different demeanor, totally different tone of voice. Are your friends in the restaurant? <laughs> I'm from Chicago. We'd be suspicious. I'm like, what's up? Am I getting set up? You know, I'm getting ready to get my back to the wall. I'm going to have to throw down. She says, I said, I, I don't know. You wouldn't let me go see. She says, oh, well, go. Please go. And she personally escorted me to the restaurant. And as I walked into the restaurant, and I looked back at her <laughs> smiling sweetly, I realized I had experienced the power of love. Now, that was 1989. 1992, I became a professional storyteller. I went to one of the storytelling meetings that I go to in the LA area, and I told this story. And after the, uh, the meeting, people were coming up, oh, Michael, that was a wonderful story. That's a great story. And I am someone who is not uncomfortable receiving praise, OK? You may want to remember that for later. Um, <laughs> this one friend seems to be particularly moved by the story. A few months later, she comes up to me after this meeting and says, Michael, Michael, let me tell you what happened. It seems that at her job, her boss was giving her unholy hell each and every day. And this particular day, she was um, determined she was going to do the pink thing. She was going to send her love. If not love, she would send like. If not like, she wouldn't send those, I want to choke you around your neck thoughts. <laughs> you do the best you can. So she'd been doing that all morning. At lunch, all the employees were sitting together in a little tiny lunchroom. The boss was sitting here talking to someone over there. My friend was sitting next to her talking to someone over there. And suddenly, the boss turned to my friend and started to engage her in pleasant, complimentary conversation. And from that day on, there was no more mess. The power of love. Now, I'm going to fess up. I passed that one particular test. I have flunked quite a few. <laughs> but it is worth the effort. And that's the end of that.
Okay, I'm gonna tell one or uh, maybe one more story, maybe one more little short story, then we'll do a Q and A. Um, wanna tell? Oh, okay, I gotta tell you this one. How many of you? Um, well, no, I know all of you. In, in, in high school, you have to take history. How many of you enjoyed history? Yeah, okay, so that's about right, about five of y'all. <laughs> Generally, history is one of the driest, dullest, mind-numbing subjects that is taught. The only thing that might be worse is geography, okay? I mean, it can be bad. It can be really, really bad, but history shouldn't be, especially if it's told by a storyteller. So this is another bit of African-American history, and this is a story about the Old West, about a woman from the Old West. She was known as Mary Fields. Well, she, her name was Mary Fields. She was known as Stagecoach Mary. Now, Mary Fields was born in Tennessee around 1832. Now, if you were black and born in Tennessee around 1832, what does that say about your probable status in life? She and her family, her mother and father, they were slaves. They were owned by a family called the Duns. Now, slave masters went, they were better than most in that one, they didn't break the family up by selling folks off here and there. And they not only allowed, but they encouraged Mary to learn how to read and to write. Now, was that common during slavery? In fact, it was what? It was against the law. Now, Mary was a headstrong girl from the time she <laughs> into the world. She had her own way of doing things. And together with Dolly Dunn, the Dunn's daughter, she got into all kinds of mischief until Dolly was eventually sent away to school. Coming up on the plantation, everybody had to work, boys and girls just as much as the men and the women. The one task just about everybody had to participate in was picking cotton. Mary didn't like picking cotton. What Mary liked to do was plow the fields, because Mary loved horses. And when she plowed the fields, she got to ride the horse. But she had to figure out some kind of way to keep from having to pick that cotton. Now, when you pick cotton, you're supposed to take the little cotton thing, put it in the bag. Take the little cotton. Mary just grabbed everything and stuffed it in the bag. She figured if she did it wrong long enough, they stopped asking her to do it. And she was right. Don't try that in class, though. I don't think it worked. Now, Coming up on that plantation, especially after Mary left, I mean, after Dolly left, Mary hung out with the boys and learned how to do everything that the boys learned how to do. She already knew how to ride. She learned how to rope. She learned how to shoot. She turned, learned how to throw down. Mary was bad. And after a little while, who do you think got to running things on that plantation? Mm-hmm. And Mary didn't take no mess. Civil War came and the Civil War went. After the Civil War, now Mary was free. And when the Duns moved to Ohio, she moved with them. They, had pay, they were paying her for the work that she did. One day she gets a letter. The letter was from Sister Mary Amadeus. Her old friend Dolly had become a nun and was in charge of St. Peter's, Peter's mission in Montana. And that letter was asking her to come there and help her to build up the mission. <laughs> Mary beeline there. They hadn't seen each other since they were shorties, okay? Mary had grown to be a big woman. She was at least six feet tall, about 200 pounds. And at a time when women weren't supposed to wear pants because pants were considered men's clothes, that's all Mary wore. If she wore a dress, she wore it over her pants. And her favorite pieces of jewelry were her pistol and her Winchester rifle. And Mary didn't take no mess. So Dolly, Sister Mary Amadeus and Mary, they back together again. Mary went right to work. If a building had to be built, Mary was helping to build that building. If a boulder had to be moved, Mary was helping to build that boulder. And after a little while, who you think got to running that work crew? Mm-hmm. Now, how do you think these men felt having a woman and a black woman at that telling them what to do? They were not pleased. But you know something? Mary helped him get used to it real quick. One day, this new guy was goofing off, taking like he had an executive lunch. Mary called him on it. Get back to work. We could have a building built in the time you spent over there taking your lunch. Now, move it. 
he jumped up and said, don't no black slave tell no white man what to do. Now, I know the people gathered around like, I know he didn't go there. <laughs> oh, no, he didn't. And Mary said, there ain't no slaves here, and I will tell you what to do. Now, get back to work. And she turned to go take care of her business. This man runs up behind Mary, hits her in the back of the head, and knocks her down. Mary jumped up, dusted herself off, and said, strap on your irons and meet me in the street. Now, in the Old West, there was a code. If anybody, man, woman, or child, challenged you, you had to face up or get out of town. And if he had not accepted this challenge from this woman, from this black woman, forget about leaving town, uh, leaving the territory, leaving the country, he'd have to left the planet. <laughs> he went out in the street and Mary was waiting. And she was, waiting for him to make his move. He slapped leather, got off one shot, he went straight into the ground. She got off three. They went straight through him, sent him on to a much closer relationship to wherever he was going. <laughs> Mary holstered her pistol, turned to the crowd that had gathered around. Y'all saw it was a fair fight. Don't nobody put their hands on me. Now y'all get back to work. You think they got back to work? Oh yeah. You would have thought they were that android dated from Star Trek the way they were moving. But word got back to the bishop. And the bishop didn't think it was right for missionary workers to be plugging holes in people. Go figure. <laughs> well, Sister Mary Amadeus was looking out for her friend. She says, Mary, there's a new way that you can help the mission. They're about to establish a stagecoach mail run from Cascade, Montana, to the mission here at St. Peter's, and they're looking for a stagecoach driver. But Mary, it's a tough job. It's a dangerous job. And there's going to be a lot of men trying to get that good government job. Mary said, if a man can do the job, I can do the job. In fact, if a man can't do the job, I can do the job. Where I got to go? Sister Mary Amadeus told her, Mary got on the horse and she boogity, boogity, boogity on down there. There was 40, 50 men trying to get that job. She got off her horse, she walked through those men, they parted like the Red Sea. I'm here for the stagecoach driver's job. Who I got to see? Uh, you need to talk to the manager over there. She went over to the manager and said, I'm here for the stagecoach driver's job. What I got to do to get it? He looked at her and said, you a woman, this is a man's job. And tried to walk away. You know he didn't get far. <laughs> Mary was all up in his face. I said, I'm here for the stage show drivers. Now, what I got to do to get it? Uh, in order to do this job, you got to be able to hitch up a team of horses. You got to be able to hitch them up fast. You got to be able to run that team. She said, I can hitch up a team of horses faster and run them better than any man here. She said, well, there's the stagecoach. There's the horses. Let me see. <laughs> Mary had those horses hitched up like that. She got up on that stage coach. She took the reins in one hand. She took that whip in the other. She snapped that whip by the lead horse. She said, move it! Those horses were doing pirouettes. <laughs> they was moonwalking and carrying on. You hear what I'm saying? She rode those horses all around those men, stood up on that stage coach, said, nah, can any of y'all do that job faster or better than me? You think they could? Not even close. Mary had the job. But check this out. Mary Fields was 60 years old when she took that job as a stagecoach driver. Make me tired thinking about it. 60 years old. And she did that job for somewhere between 8 to 10 hard years. Just like Sister Mary Amadeus told her, it was a rough and dangerous job. One time, she was coming from Cascade, and she was driving that team of horses, driving that team of horses. Sister Mary Amadeus was sick and she had the medicine to make her better. But as she was driving that team, that wheel hit a rock or went into a gully or something. Wheel came off, stagecoach went flying, stuff flying, horses going every which way, Mary flying. Mary had to pull it all together and fix it all out there in the middle of nowhere by herself. By the time she got through fixing the stagecoach, it was nighttime. She couldn't drive, no, no one couldn't see. She couldn't go to sleep because there were coyotes and wolves out there waiting to nibble on her and her horses. 
She had to stay up all night long, popping those coyotes and wolves to keep them away. Cracking on, got the medicine of Sister Mary Amadeus in time. On other occasions, they would be attacked by bandits. And when those bandits would attack, Mary would take the reins in one hand, take one of her favorite pieces of jewelry in the other. She'd be going pop, pop, pop. Bandits would be going drop, drop, drop. And after a little while, word got out. The bandits would be laying across the country. Here come the, the, the. uh-oh. Uh, Black Mary driving the stagecoach. We, let, let's get this one go by. Let, let, let this one go. Let this one go. Because Mary didn't take no mess. So after about eight or 10 years, Mary had enough. She decided to try something else. She tried a couple of businesses. First business she tried, she opened up a restaurant. Two problems. One, she was too good hearted. People came to the restaurant without money, she fed them anyway, but that wasn't the real problem. Mary couldn't cook worth nothing. <laughs> and even the people that ate free didn't come back. <laughs> so then she decided to open up a business doing laundry for the cowboys. And she'd do their laundry and they would pay her at the end of the month or the end of the roundup, whenever they got paid, they come and pay her. But every now and then, somebody tried to tip off without paying. One day, Mary's sitting in a tavern drinking with some of her male buddies. Uh, before I continue with this segment of the story, I gotta explain something about the situation in this tavern. There was a law in this town. Women couldn't drink with the men in the tavern. So on another occasion, Mary's drinking with some of her male buddies, and this guy sees her in the Tavern drinking, he go run into the sheriff. Sheriff, sheriff, there's a woman. She over there in the, in the tavern drinking with the men. Sheriff got up all bad and said, what? I'll take care of this right away. Who'd have the nerve to do that? Uh, sheriff, it's that black murder. Sheriff said, who? <laughs> all the bass went out of his mouth. He turned right back around, went right back to his desk, pulled out that law and wrote an amendment on the spot. No women but Mary. Because Mary didn't take. So Mary sees this guy in the bar drinking at the tavern. She figured he got money to drink, he got money to pay her. When he walks out, she walks right out behind him, taps him on the shoulder, says, excuse me, you owe me for your laundry, pay up. And he turned around and looks at her, I ain't paying you nothing. <laughs> Bless you. And tried to walk away. Let me tell you something else about Mary. Mary had a running bet in this town, one dollar bet, that she could knock out any man with one punch. Mary never lost a penny. Now Mary was not the type of person who would hit someone in the back of their head. So in a very ladylike way, she turned him around, pop, ooh, boing, knocked him clean out. She stood over him and waited for him to come too. And when he came to, she said, pay up. He reached in his pocket, gave all his money. She took exactly what was owed and not a penny more. Gave him back the rest of the money and said, now don't let it happen again. And you know it didn't. Mary feels lived to be about 82 years old. She died a nice, quiet, and peaceful death. And that's the legend of Mary Fields, AKA Stagecoach Mary. And that's the end of that. Okay, let's do, uh, uh, let's do some Q&A here. Questions, questions, questions. About the stories I told you, about what I do as a storyteller. Quest, yes. Whole wheat toast. <laughs> Holy toast, yeah! Eat this toast and you're saved, you testify. Whoo! Toast that floats up in the air. Oh, yes, got a little weight. I, that's good, I like, I'm using that. Holy toast. <laughs> yes, thank you, that's good, I like that. <laughs> Holy toast, oh, woo, oh, woo. I love my job. <laughs> Other questions? Yes? Jamaica, I've been to Jamaica. And what's gonna be it for me is when I go to Barbados, because my mother was from Barbados, and I've never been, so that's one of my life missions to go there. Oh, I, I wanna go everywhere. I want to, if there's a country I haven't been to it, other than Iceland, well actually now the way global warming, it might not be Iceland too much longer, then I'll go. But I want to go everywhere. 
In fact, like I said, I've been to about 25 countries, and I used to think that was a lot of countries. And I was talking to one of my neighbors one day, and I was very smugly saying, yes, I've been to <coughs> over 20 countries. She said, that ain't nothing. I've been to over 100. <laughs> Shut me up. You have a question? Oh, um, what color is your parachute? That's the name of it. It's a classic for people trying to find their careers. What color is, is, what color is your parachute? What color is my parachute? But it's color and parachute and what? <laughs> That's the name of that book. Yeah. Yes? You just have the one daughter? Uh, all I know of, yeah. Um, <laughs> I have a daughter, my daughter. I have a stepson who lives up around Travis Air Force Base, and that's it. In fact, my daughter, <laughs> oh, my daughter's so much like me. We were talking a couple of years ago. She says, I can see why you only had me. When you have perfection, what point is there in going on? <laughs> That's my baby. <laughs> my daughter and I were having a conversation one time, and we were saying, uh, my daughter said to me, you know, Daddy, we don't have any low self-esteem issues, do we? <laughs> Because we know we all that, and a bag of blue corn chips. <laughs> Other questions? Yes? Yes. Yes, in fact, I have a, I have a, like I said, I run a storytelling group in LA, and I have several people who are in, in that group who have come up as storytellers through that group. And then there are other people who, because I communicate with people around the country and around the world, and there are other people who have been inspired to, if not become professional storytellers, use storytelling in whatever their fields are. I, I do trainings for teachers, librarians, other storytellers, business people, uh, attorneys to teach them storytelling. So yeah, it's been one of the great blessings of my life to have people keeping it on. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Good question, good question. Several things. The first thing, and, 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 and a lot of people think this, I do not memorize stories. Of the hundreds of stories I have told, I've only ever memorized one story. It was a piece by Langston Hughes where the wording was critical to the story. I do not memorize stories. And people try to memorize, and that makes it hard for them. I visualize. I learn a story, whether it be my story, a history, historical story, whatever. And I go over the story in my mind until I can see the images. And when I tell you the story, I'm recounting to you what I see, which can sometimes be a very scary thing. But um, that is one of the things, that, the challenges that people have. The other challenge that people have is, is getting up in front of a group, group of people. Because what is it? Shown that people, most people would rather face death than face standing up in front of a group of people. I do not have that problem. I am a ham. But for a lot of people, it's overcoming that getting up in front of people. And that's something you just have to practice at. You just get in some of the small groups, and you come to know your story, you know your material, and then you just give it. And then learning the fact that the easiest thing when you are telling stories is that you tell a story that you love. You tell a story that means something to you. One of the first gigs I had as a storyteller I was doing stories at a mariachi festival in East LA. It was myself and this librarian storyteller. And when I met her, we introduced ourselves, and she said, um, you speak Spanish? I said, no. She said, oh, most of the audience did not speak English. Well, not being able to do a matrix download and learn Spanish, I had to just go with what I knew. And as you can see, I tend to be somewhat animated. So I did my program, and afterwards, the sound guy came up to me. He says, man, you're good. Half of those people didn't understand what the heck he was saying, and they were having a great time. <laughs> because if you tell a story that you love and care for, there's something about it that transcends language. I was doing a pro presentation in St. Petersburg, Russia. I had a translator. The audience would start laughing before the translator could say anything, <laughs> OK, just because of <laughs> so those are some of the things that people have to overcome. 
Other questions? I saw another hand somewhere. Yes? Can you tell stories from a different time? Yeah. Yeah, I'm always amazed by what the heck comes out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes something comes out of my mouth and I'm looking, I'm saying, ooh, that was good. Hope I remember that. Because, because I don't memorize stories, the story is free. And every, uh, see, storytelling, there are three parts to storytelling. The storyteller, the audience, and the story. And those three are, it's like, it's like a dance. I mean, as I look at you, and when I told some of the stories today that I've been telling, like that Power of Love story, I've been telling for, for years. Um, at least, at least, I think, 15, maybe 15 years. And I said things in it today that I've never said before. And it's all about the audience in that moment looking at you, me telling the story, and then stuff happens. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite surprised. I'm watching me tell just like you are. <laughs> yes? Do you have a favorite psychologist or age group? Uh, grown folk. I love to tell college and up. Um, I, I mean, I love telling everybody, but there are, there are certain challenges you have. The hardest thing for me as a storyteller is preschool. <laughs> if you gave me the choice, all right, Michael, you can go tell to these preschool kids, or you can go tell on death row to former Klansmen and Nazis. I'm on death row, <laughs> OK? Preschool kids are work. I did a preschool program yesterday. And preschool kids are with you as long as they look at you. <laughs> but they do like that, you cease to exist. And they just have enough, and, and they look. I was doing a show, and this kid, he was sitting in the front row, and he was doing fine. All of a sudden, his head dropped down. He saw something on the floor. It was all over. <laughs> so that's the hardest group to tell for. And with kids from elementary school, middle school, and high school, a lot of storytellers don't do high schools and middle schools because kids have this attitude. Storytelling, I ain't no damn kid. I ain't no kid. I don't tell me no story. I have special stories for that group, but it's work, all right? It's, it's a lot of work. You, you, but from college on up, y'all got some sense. <laughs> and you don't have the, you know, teenage years, you got hormones flying every which way, boy. It's just a, whoa! It's a minefield. But I love telling because when I, I can tell, I pretty much the same stories I tell the kids, I tell to adults for the most part. There are some special stories I tell for preschool kids to get them. <laughs> but um, with adults, you get all the nuance of the story, the subtleties of the story. And it ain't as much work. Although, you know, but there's always somebody in the audience. Huh, uh huh, storyteller. OK. And I don't care how small or big my audience is. I have done programs to over 1,000 people. I will see the people in the audience who don't want to be there. Like, mate me laugh. <laughs> and there was this one woman, sister, and she was like, <laughs> I mean, I'm talking fire coming out the nostrils and carrying on. And I, I, I would always come back to her, and I was telling my story, and then, <laughs> <laughs> Got her. But I love to tell stories to adults. I love to tell stories. I mean, I, I, but, and with kids, there's this light that goes on in everybody when you get to this point in, this, in storytelling. And it's just wonderful to see. Other questions? Okay, I've got time for maybe one more. Maybe two for the short one. Yes? How many kids do you have Are they better Oh, uh, come up afterwards, I'll give you my card. You can contact me if you want to know anything about storytelling. Feel free to use me as a resource. You want to find out about storytelling wherever you are, I'll hook you up. So just come up afterwards and I'll give you my card. All right, yes. Thank you.
Fathers, we live for those moments. Oh, oh. All right, thank you all very, very much. Like, oh yeah, yes. M-C-C-A-R-T-Y. Like I said, if you want a card, come on up. I'll give you one of my business cards. Thank you all. <laughs>